Having just commemorated Landing Day, we're now in the thick of this year's 1982 commemoration season, and it's good to be able to talk to someone who was here in the Falklands, who served with the forces and can therefore speak with some authority and experience. I've come to Stanley's Royal British Legion headquarters to meet Captain Chris Locke. I suppose I should perhaps say that we're not really in uh, Hillside um, because that is rather difficult to get into at the moment so we've, we've adjourned to the deanery. So thank you so much for joining us today Chris in this strange virtual world although I suppose it is becoming a bit more friendly and less strange as the restrictions are gradually mm. being eased back. Um, although of course we do realise that things could change at any time. So I gather you actually first came to the Falklands in 82 when you were in the Royal Fleet Auxiliary which I understand is a separate branch of the Navy, is that right? Correct, yeah, I mean the Royal Fleet Auxiliary is the, 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 the part of the, the stores ammunitioning part that supports the Royal Navy but interestingly I actually first came to the islands on my very first trip as a young man in 1977 oh, uh, right. on a ship called RFA Olwyn. Uh, it was part of something called Operation Journeyman and it was when the Argentines first looked at uh, the Falklands with some serious sort of thoughts and the Argentines had landed on uh, South Fuel and we were quite a small little task force which went down to uh, that part of the world and um, well, in the end, the right. Argentines left. I haven't actually heard about yeah. that. It was a secret mission. Uh, <laughs> My very oh, first trip to sea. <laughs> but, but interestingly, I mean, I always think about it's quite long and hard. It's, that was my first connection with the um, Falklands, and that right. was when I was 17. Right. And I'd never really thought that many years later I'd be <laughs> living here. But it was the start of my connection with the Falklands. Right. And looking back, I mean, do you see that as a high spot of your naval career? No, it's not a high spot, it, it, but it it's, um, was an important part. I mean, there's been many parts of my career. So, over 42 years, I've sort of been at sea. There have been many different high po high points points in it, uh, but it was certainly a, a catalyst for where we are now. Right. I mean, if you ask me for high points, there's been been many, um, but I think actually going to South Georgia on RFA support vessels has been a very important part of my my career. But also going around the world in RFAs and also the, the sort of academic side of it where I spent a year studying military defence. Right, yeah. right. they quite a career then. <laughs> <laughs> my, I mean my sailing experience is quite limited to small boats um, and regular crossings of the Irish Sea in heavy gales so I do know what it what it's like to, to be at sea in, uh, in bad weather mm. but I imagine that you can empathise particularly um, with the lads who saved, uh, sailed on HMS Glamorgan or Sheffield or some of the other ships that were actually seeing active service in 82. I mean it's very hard to sort of empathise with particularly the Sheffield and Glamorgan because clearly those guys went mm. through a tr very traumatic um, event but I can empathise with the whole task group and I can remember you know, being on watch, junior officer, we used to keep the 8 o'clock in the morning till midday and we used to keep GMT, so sunrise was about 11 o'clock, obviously 11 in the morning and I can remember that very clearly and you know, the very the dry days, the, the poor visibility, of the high seas, so I think thinking about what the guys on the, well, all the ships, on the merchant ships and the warships would have been going through, I can really empathise with that but you talk about Glamorgan and Sheffield, clearly there was a completely different sort of event going on there for them, mm, and also yeah. the Atlantic Mavea, yeah, um, yes. which I just can't imagine what that would be like. Because the Atlantic Conveyor presumably, I mean you could have been serving on that. Not the Atlantic Conveyor because huh? she was a true merchant vessel, right. the RFA is a, was, a, was an individual, so it's like a, its own fertility of right. maybe government sponsored vessels, but pu purely just um, support the Navy. The Atlantic Conveyor was a ship taken up from trade, a stuff right. ship, uh, just would be normal doing normal operations, commercial operations, and she was used by the by the military mm. to bring the Harriers down basically. So mm. that's the, uh, the, 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 the helicopters. Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, as, as uh, we've just said, we're in the middle of the 82 memorial season, um, and I know that you lay wreaths at many of the memorials on behalf of RBL. Yeah. How do you actually feel personally about that? Um, it's really important to me. It started really laying wreaths again for the RFA, for the Royal Fleet Zero, and the association with that, because there is an association. Uh, and I used to think a lot about what the RFAs had gone through in 82, mm. particularly Sir Galahad and Tristram out at Fitzroy. And then when I became the chairman of the British Legion, I sort of brought all those thoughts together collectively, thinking more about um, all the wars that have gone through past and the suffering and the the loss, um, particularly during the two minutes, which clearly you always have the two minutes uh, silence before the wreath laying, and that's when you gather all your thoughts together and think about everybody's collectively um, mm. what would have gone gone yeah. through. But as I said, it started with the RFA. I used to lay wreaths in the UK for the RFA, right. um, and it's progressed to where we are now. Yes, um, and where we are now, we we have. L lots of vets coming down year sure, after year yeah. but presumably there won't be so many or any uh, yeah. this year I'm not aware of any um, and no I, I'm absolutely certain there's none this year um, but we always when we can we always try and engage with veterans uh, like socially and also as the chairman of the British Legion we always open our doors to the British the British Legion open their doors to veterans and we always make a point of trying to meet up with them and what surprises me is that as we go on year and year after and we're coming up to the 40 well the yeah. 38th now yeah. but it will be the 40th anniversary there are still veterans that come down and never been here before yes and are trying to sort of uh, re relive and uh, go through sort of a cleansing process. Uh, right. You can see it very clearly as the mm. veterans who come in uh, who are all quite uptight and when they go they are in a completely different state of mind. Mm. I mean, you were a young man yourself in 82. How? So you have personal experience of, of that. How do you think um, the young airmen and soldiers and sailors felt um, on coming 8,000 miles here um, to face uh, to face an enemy I think um, and I was like that too it's exciting you don't know what's going to happen you've done all this training you probably want to put it into practice mm. although you it's probably it was just as we sailed I remember sailed on, sailed on the ship on the 6th of April excited we're going to do some of this training work never really understanding what combat was going to be all about and for me I never came ashore so I never saw the sort of the, the sort of the, the nuts and bolts the mm. nitty gritty of what happened mm. but when we first heard of the first ships being bombed and sunk the reality then hit home and I think yeah yes I, I understand it, uh, it hit home and the, the reality of what we were doing mm -hmm. and that changed things mm -hmm. yeah. Hmm. So, I mean, talking about vets um, coming here to cleanse themselves, as, hmm. as you hmm. put it, uh, I mean, clearly there are mental health um, issues involved. We're hearing an awful lot about mental health at sure. the moment. Yeah. Um, I get the impression that perhaps back in '82 it wasn't such a live topic. Yeah. How do you feel about that? I would really agree with you, um, Ian. It wasn't. I think it was probably more highlighted in the Gulf War when people just came back from the first Gulf War with, with PTSD. I think it's the first time, not the first time. It clearly there was shell shock in the, in the first yeah, World War. Yeah, we talked yeah, about shell shock, yeah. but I think the realities um, hit home um, more recently. You can see that now. Yeah. And there are people in the community, actually, in Stanley and. Um, presumably in the wider um, islands, um, who are suffering from, I suppose we could perhaps describe it as a form of PTSD. Oh, absolutely. There's, absolutely. There's no doubt about it. I mean, I just go back to, I had a dear friend uh, who was on Sir Galahad in 1982. He's since passed away. But um, I never knew him before um, 82. I only knew him afterwards, but he was always a very quiet, reserved mm. gentleman who very rarely spoke about what happened on Sir Galahad, and it's only a couple of times when we mm. could have 
had a few beers and he would open up a bit. But I knew him for many years and um, I'm absolutely sure that he had some inner PTSD concerns mm. and problems that he it, just couldn't talk it, about. It's a sort of similar story to relatives that we probably all had, you know, in the Second World War mm. or going back further, the First War, who just would never talk about their experiences yeah. throughout their lives, yeah. perhaps not even yeah. right at the very yeah. end. I think that was certainly the case with this, this close friend of mine who was awarded the Queen's Gantry Medal for what he, mm. what he did um, on the 8th of June. And um, we'll never know because he's now passed away and we never had those conversations. Mm. Mm. So I, I know you're working very hard for RBL, Chris. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, RBL in, in the public mind is primarily associated with the poppy appeal and remembrance, I yes. suppose. Yes, yes. Um, but I guess there's a whole lot more to it. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> Our main focus is the poppy appeal. And we have the poppy ball and we generate about £10,000 for the poppy appeal but yes it's more being part of the community being active in the community we have our social events once a month where anybody who wants to join the Royal British Legion can and I think it's quite important um, to point out that you haven't got to have been in the, in the forces to have been a member of the Royal British Legion and anybody's welcome if they support the aims and objectives of the Legion which is basically to support veterans and, the, and, and uh, personnel in, mm. in the military and finally, I mean, you've mentioned yourself uh, a minute or two back um, about the 40th anniversary of liberation. I mean, it's going to attract a lot of attention. Um, how important do you think that is for the islands uh, and I suppose for the vets themselves? It's clearly a milestone in... Um you wonder how many milestones we can have. <laughs> I mean, I remember taking part in the 25th anniversary and being marched down the Mall in front of Buckingham Palace and thought, well, that's probably it, 25th. Mm. Uh, and then we had the 30th anniversary, which wasn't perhaps quite as big as we'd have thought. Now we're on to the 40th anniversary. One wonder, wonders whether there's going to be 50th, and I'm absolutely certain there will be. But I think for the islands, it's a, and, and everybody who was involved in it too, it's a very important milestone um, to think back 40 years ago that's quite incredible really and how the islands have changed beyond any recognition in those 40 years and that's right now, not yeah. just survived not but survived. completely yeah. expanded and grown and you know the islands are on the international market they, mm. are, they, they are talked mm. about and known about whereas 40 years ago 38 years ago they, they, they were less so mm. yeah. so actually quite a lot to look forward to I absolutely think so, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much, Chris, for talking to us. Sure. Um, it's been really interesting, actually, just listening to your um, your reflections on what happened. It's a pleasure. I was going to say so long ago, but it's not actually that long ago, you know, in, our, in, in terms yeah. of our lifetime. No. I mean, I think, you know, you... you it's important to say I wasn't wasn't part of the, of the the land forces. We stayed at sea, so I was relatively safe um, compared to what others would have seen. So I perhaps was I'm lucky in that in that respect. But I also feel that it was a duty that I'm proud to have done. And uh, and you were in I, danger. I mean, so, <laughs> but had I not been part of that uh, task force. And then not subsequently come back. There is, I would not be living here now. So yeah, it's it's an important uh, change of life. It, yeah, it's yeah. a life changer. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. We've spent the last few weeks thinking about COVID nineteen and the impact it's having on our own lives. How do we react in a crisis? What does our Christian faith say about loving our neighbour? Today we've just heard Chris Locke talking about remembrance and why it's so important to him to keep alive the memories of those who gave their lives in the Falklands conflict in 1982. But this year, of course, everything is different. So as you've heard many times before, welcome to the new normal. 
Even remembering isn't quite the same, with social distancing, little singing, and trying to remember not even to welcome anyone, as you would expect to do with a shake of the hand. Our services of remembrance this year, however, are no less meaningful or reverent. Some might say that they are even more so because the current crisis has sharpened our senses and made us aware of what it means to be fighting for our lives. In a sense, we're on the front line ourselves in ensuring that these memorials continue, despite what a world pandemic may have to throw against us. And that sense of resilience and triumph is matched by our opening hymn, although it's on a very different theme, the ascension of Jesus into heaven. Hail the day that sees him rise, published by Charles Wesley in 1739, is one of the most popular Ascension Day hymns in the English language, helped by a rousing tune originating in Wales. It really needs no introduction. The hymn makes use of some wonderful language, including phrases like his throne above the skies, yon azure height, and beyond the skies. So it seemed fairly obvious that whilst listening to the words, we should also be watching and thinking about our own skies as the clouds race across. The words are on the screen, so please do join in at home if you would like to.
God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, for 40 days we have been celebrating with joyful hearts the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, his bursting from the tomb and his defeat of the power of sin and death. He appeared to his disciples many times and told them about the kingdom of God. Today we recall how he left this earth and returned to his Father, ascending into heaven to take his throne over all dominions and powers. Trusting in his reign over all creation and submitting to his kingly yet loving rule, let us hear the story of his parting, read for us this morning by Debbie Lake. The reading is taken from Acts 1, reading from verse 1 through to 11. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, for which you have heard me speak about. For John baptised with water, but in a few days you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know this time or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up to the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. Amen. Seeing we have a great high priest who has passed through the heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us offer him the praise worthy of his name. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray that our risen and ascended Lord will lead us to eternal life. Grant, we pray, Almighty God, that as we believe your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to have ascended into the heavens, so we, in heart and mind, may also ascend 
and with him continually dwell, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. For our next hymn, we turn to another well-known and popular composition, this time from the pen of Scotsman Walter Chalmers Smith. Based almost entirely on the first letter of Timothy, it's a hymn of praise that focuses on the creator of all things, the invisible God whose work whilst remaining a mystery testifies to his engagement with the world. Smith, born in Aberdeen, and a minister who worked primarily in Edinburgh was a man of wide interests, becoming a well-known poet as well as a prolific hymn writer. Immortal Invisible God Only Wise was first published in 1867 and soon captured the public imagination. It has remained in the repertoire of church choirs and congregations to this day. As we sing about the work of the Invisible God, we look down towards the cathedral from the upper part of Stanley, and the weather conditions, despite warm days and wonderful sunsets, remind us that winter is almost here. Please do join in the singing if you'd like to, but at this time of ascension, look carefully at the cloud formations. <laughs> And silent as light, nor wanting, nor wasting, thou rulest in might. Thy justice like mountains, thy soaring above, thy clouds which are fountains of goodness and love. After that great hymn of praise, which acknowledges both our own immortality and our complete reliance on God, we turn now to that immortal, invisible God only wise, and in his presence we give thanks for the night now past. The day lies open before us, so let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, stretch our imaginations to sense the majesty and mystery of your Son's ascension. Amen. And as we think about stretching our imaginations, we listen to the word of God from both the Old Testament and the New. And first to read the psalm set down for Ascension Day, we welcome Daphne Arthur Armand, while Canon Cathy Biles reads from the 24th chapter of the Gospel according to Luke. Clap your hands together, all you peoples. O sing to God with shouts of joy. 
for the Lord Most High is to be feared. He is the great King over all the earth. He subdued the peoples under us and the nations under our feet. He has chosen our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God has gone up with a merry noise, the Lord with the sound of the trumpet. O oh, sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with all your skill. God reigns over the nations, God has taken his seat upon his holy throne. The nobles of the peoples are gathered together with the people of the God of Abraham. For the powers of the earth belong to God, and he is very highly exalted. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus said to the disciples, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And see, I am sending upon you what my father promised, so stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Our next hymn, O oh, the Deep, Deep Love of Jesus, is a new one to me and maybe to you as well. It was written by Samuel Trevor Francis in 1875 after experiencing the love of Jesus as a teenager when contemplating throwing himself into the River Thames one dark night. It proved to be a spiritual turning point for Francis who went on to become a successful merchant, a local preacher with the Plymouth Brethren and a hymn writer. The words compare the love of Jesus to the limitless bounds of the ocean and emphasise the unchanging nature of God's love for us all. The words are on the screen, so please do join in at home if you would like to. Meanwhile, although the hymn compares the love of Jesus to an ocean vast of blessing, we leave the sea for a moment to wander through the polytunnels at Stanley Nurseries to look at God's world in a slightly different way. Oh, 
hope you've got your feet firmly on the ground today. There are plenty of people who can't understand what Ascension is all about, much less believe that Jesus, the Son of God, crucified, dead and buried, somehow ascended into the heavens to be with his Father, God everlasting, on this 40th day after Easter so many years ago. And here we are celebrating something we can't prove actually happened. Have we taken leave of our senses? After all, everyone knows that after death our bodies remain behind in graveyards like our own, or they get burnt to ashes, which can be disposed in various different ways. Whichever way you think about it, death, in that sense, is the end of the body. Legally speaking, after death, there isn't even any ownership in a body. Legally speaking, after death, there isn't even any ownership in a body, because we know that it has to be disposed of. In the words of the funeral service, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our frail bodies, that they may be conformed to his glorious body, who died, was buried, and rose again for us. To him be glory for ever. But there, of course, is the clue as to why today became so important in the early church, and why it is still celebrated now as one of the major events following those dramatic days after the first Easter. Jesus appears to the disciples. He promises to stay with them, even though dead. And he promises to transform their lives by sending the Holy Spirit, which we celebrate shortly at Pentecost. When in the committal following a funeral we talk about transforming our frail bodies, that they may be conformed to his glorious body, we're not thinking of Jesus on the cross or in the tomb or even talking with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. We're really thinking about him rejoining the Father by his own power. We're thinking of him becoming one with God again. We're thinking about his transformational power. In, in our, our case, we are thinking of the soul rejoining its maker. The tradition is that Jesus literally rose through the air to be with his father. And there are several wonderful paintings in English churches which depict the event by showing the tradition is that Jesus literally rose through the air to be with his father. And there are several wonderful paintings in early English churches which depict the event by showing two feet sticking out of a cloud. I love that imagery, but today we might be rather sceptical about such things, but that isn't to say that it didn't happen. And of course, we say regularly those words in the Nicene Creed. He, that is Jesus, ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. The historical fact is that for whatever reason, the body of Jesus disappeared. But his resurrected body is described in the presence of 11 of the apostles as being taken up to heaven. Maybe we should be satisfied with that, because there is a sense in which we can try too hard to find logical explanations for everything. We do not and cannot understand everything fully. So it is right today to reflect on one of the mysteries of our Christian faith, and that is how it should be. First, that it is a mystery, and second, that we need to think carefully about it and what it means for us today. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Let us pray. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. 
The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. The Church expresses this faith in the words of the Creed, and I invite you now to join with me at home. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We come now to a time of intercession to offer prayers for ourselves, for others, and for God's wider world. Let us pray. Blessed are you, Lord our God, for you have raised your Son from the darkness of death to the fullness of life eternal, to your right hand on high. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he has restored us to eternal life. By his ascension he has opened for us the gate of glory. Blessed are you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As we rejoice in the ascension, we give thanks for men and women of vision, for those who have shared their faith with us. We remember all whose lives are clouded by doubt or despair. We pray for those who feel life is dull, that they may come to know the joy of the presence of the ascended Lord. Lord, empower your church and all who claim Christ Jesus as their saviour to proclaim the good news of your saving acts. As we rejoice in your presence, we remember all who feel lonely and neglected in our world. We ask your blessing on all who are oppressed and those who are struggling to survive, and especially at this time, all who have lost loved ones through the COVID-19 pandemic. We pray for all who are caught up in violence and war, and for those not at peace with each other, with themselves, or with you. As we rejoice in your love, we remember our loved ones, our homes, and our families. We pray for our community and neighborhood, and we ask your blessing upon all who strive to brighten this world by their dedication and goodness, by their faith and willingness to sacrifice. As we rejoice in your power, we remember all whose powers are waning, the elderly and the infirm, and all who are disabled. We ask your blessing upon all who are ill or have been injured in accidents. May they find courage and hope and in your abiding love. We rejoice that you are great high priest who ascended into heaven and that you are at the right hand of God making intercessions for us. May our loved ones departed and all your faithful rejoice in you and rest in the glory of your kingdom. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And now as we gather our prayers, the spoken word, and the innermost thoughts of our hearts and minds, let us join as one voice in the prayer which Jesus gave his first disciples, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn today was written by the great 18th century hymn writer Isaac Watts. John Wesley changed the opening line from Our God to O oh God, Our Help in Ages Past, and the two versions are still in current use today. 
A paraphrase of Psalm 90, it was first published in 1719 and it has been associated with solemn occasions ever since. Said to have been sung at the last service on the Titanic in 1912, it was also chosen by Winston Churchill in 1941 for a service inaugurating the Atlantic Charter. It's been quoted in novels by H.G. Wells, Evelyn Waugh and many others, as well as being recorded by famous vocalists like Bing Crosby. We now sing it at Ascension as we praise God for his help in ages past and express our hope for all the years to come. We also revisit the starting point of the service as we go to Blue Beach and remember all those who lost their lives on landing day. wait in silence make us ready for your coming spirit as we listen to your word make us ready for your coming spirit as we worship you in majesty make us ready for your coming spirit as we long for your refreshing make us ready for your coming spirit as we long for your renewing make us ready for your coming spirit as we long for your equipping make us ready for your holy spirit as we long for your empowering make us ready for your coming spirit we hope you are enjoying being with us during this season of easter and beyond we cannot be quite certain of when live services will restart in the real cathedral and we certainly look forward to having you with us again next Sunday. Even though Christchurch has now been reopened for private worship, social distancing and other restrictions remain in force, making it impractical to hold regular Sunday services. And we owe it to the community, I'm sure you will all agree, 
to remain cautious. Meanwhile, this service now comes to an end with a blessing after which Paul will play for us in our virtual world. May God, our Father, who raised up our humanity in Christ, feed us with the bread of heaven. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you.